This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. All Hit Radio. To the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back to the X Zone, everyone. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you live and around the world uh, from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada on the Starcom Radio Network and the Exxon Broadcast Network. If you'd like to uh, give us a call, 800-610-7035. My email address is xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And our main website where you can listen to the Exxon Live or our refeeds at www.exzoneradiotv.com. And they're available to you with our compliments 24 7 365. Exo Nation, my guest this hour, Nick Redfern, is with us. He has a brand new book out. It's called The Tupacabra Road Trip. Now, Nick is the author of more than 30 books on the world of the paranormal, the supernatural, and the unknown. His previous titles include Monster Diary, There's Something in the Woods, and Monster Files. Now, Nick has appeared on dozens of television shows, including Sci-Fi, History Channel's Proof Positive, History Channel's Monster Quest, Nat Geo, Wilds, The Monster Project, and Fox News. Nick lives a short drive from Dallas, Texas, uh, near the infamous Grassy Knoll. And joining me now from his home in Texas is Nick Redford. And Nick, always a great pleasure having you on the show. How have you been, young man? Hey, Rob, I'm doing good, thanks. How's nice things for you? Hey, listen, what can I say? I've got the best job in the whole wide world. I talk to the most <laughs> interesting people in the whole wide world, and I've been doing it for 24 years, so I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Cool. Hey, congratulations on yet another great book. Oh, well, thanks a lot. It's, uh, it's one of my big interests is cryptozoology, mm-hmm. which is the, stu- <coughs> excuse me, the study of unknown animals. And um, so I always sort of look forward to when I've got a new expedition or series of expeditions completed, then I can sort of uh, get it all written up for people. So tell us about your new book, Nick. Well, it's basically, Rob, it's um, a road trip style book, as the, hence the title, Chupacabra Road Trip. Mm-hmm. And um, it's a road trip diary type format of all the various expeditions I've been on um, looking for the Chupacabra, which goes back to the first one I did was 2004, and the first time I went to Puerto Rico. And it brings it right up literally to the present day. So it's just over a decade of investigations of, uh, as I said, expeditions around Puerto Rico, the United States, um, Mexico, and a few other places, mm-hmm. trying to figure out what these creatures are and um, how we classify them and what their origins might be. Are we any closer to understanding what the Tupacabra is? Well, it, that's an interesting question because the... The chupacabra that's been reported, or that was reported originally in Puerto Rico, is very different to the one that surfaced initially in Texas and then has now been seen in some of the surrounding states as well. Um, What's happened is that the name chupacabra has been applied to both of these things, but in reality they're two different types of creatures, so um, it depends which one we're sort of talking about. For example, we know that from um, DNA analysis, um, that the the American ones, which look like these giant hairless rats, um, but they're actually canine. But it's not as the, the skeptics have said, just canine animals with mange. That, you know, we can get into this uh, as we go on, but there's something much stranger going on than just that. Whereas the ones from Puerto Rico are described as 
looking more sort of monkey-like to mm-hmm. chimpanzee size uh, and walking on their hind legs. So, you know, we're clearly do- dealing with two different things, as I said, even though the name has been applied to both of them. When, when and where were the very first reports of the chupacabra, Nick? Well, um, the first reports that surfaced, at least under the name the chupacabra, occurred in the uh, early part of 1995 and mm-hmm. through the summer of 95 in Puerto Rico. And the reason why the name chupacabra was given to these animals was because chupacabra is a Spanish term that means goat sucker. And the reason it was given that name is because ranchers all across the island eventually were starting to um, receive attacks from in the middle of the night from this strange creature that predominantly attacked goats, but also chickens and smaller other, other small farm animals as well. But the name kind of really stuck. And it was um, associated with rumors that whatever this animal was, that it drained the blood from the animals it attacked. Hmm. And um, so that, you know, hence the term goat sucker. Now, as I said, the initial reports that began in Puerto Rico described a creature somewhere between the size of like a large monkey and a smallish looking chimpanzee, very agile, Mm -hmm. running on its back legs, but also reportedly could run on all fours as well. And a number of the witnesses said it had this row of spikes running down its head and neck. Some people even described it as having bat-like wings rather than feathery wings. And um, it really did provoke massive waves of hysteria and excitement and fear all across Puerto Rico with the, uh, all the local newspaper, magazine, radio, TV mm-hmm. stations covering it extensively. And in no time at all, it, it really did become like a, a local phenomenon. You know, when you when you gave the description of it of the chupacabra, it reminded me of a lizard that walks uh, that that runs on its back legs, that has spikes down the back, and also flanges on the sides of its head. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because one of the theories that's been put forward for the chupacabra mm-hmm. is exactly that: some sort of unknown bipedal yeah. lizard. Um, you know, um, in, in, in fact, if you hear some of those in original initial stories, it actually kind of sounds a little bit like um, like a, a small-scale dinosaur or something along right. those lines. Interesting. Now, pe- yeah, now people ask quite legitimately, how is it that something like this could suddenly surface out of nowhere in 1995? And at first glance, that sounds like a you know, a logical question to ask. Right. But one of the interesting things I found, and and I found this out on my first trip to Puerto Rico, you know, when you start speaking to the locals, Mm -hmm. you gain their confidence, they tell you stories. And what I found was that back in 1975, two years, excuse me, two decades before the initial wave of Chupacabra attacks, there's a particular area on uh, Puerto Rico called MOCA, M-O-C-A, and in 1975, there was a wave of very similar attacks back then uh, by a creature that became briefly known as the Mocha Vampire. And as the name suggests, mm-hmm. it was reportedly a very similar creature, draining blood. And then I found a story from 1966 um, where a cow had been found mutilated and drained of blood near the, on the uh, fringes of the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico, this huge, gigantic... Uh, telescope sure. that exists there and so in other words i was able to push the story back to the 60s which makes me wonder if you know these things may have been there for well as long as who knows long yeah. who knows how long uh, i think it's possible that it, that is the case but they didn't really sort of catch the attention of the media large scale till 95 and just sporadically between the 60s and the 70s but i think you know there is a good chance we're dealing with something like i said that's been there for centuries even Mm -hmm. perhaps nick is there any connection between the chupacabra and the cattle mutilations that have been going on in the u.s um well in one sense there is uh that sense is that you know we're talking about inexplicable attacks on predominantly farm animals right Now, the big difference is that if you look at the um, attacks that we get with the cattle mutilations, it sounds like a very sort of 
um, scientific type approach with specific areas of the body targeted, like the eyeballs, right. um, the tongue, the jaw, um, the sex organs, and, and things like this. Mm -hmm. And we have reports of black helicopters and strange lights and UFOs in the same vicinity of where the attacks occur. Now, with the Chupacabra attacks, <coughs> excuse me, yes, we have um, inexplicable animal attacks, but we don't have things like the eyeballs removed, the sex organs removed. Chiefly, um, we're talking about a couple of puncture wounds to the neck, which kind of sounds more like an animal because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of uh, wild animals kill their prey by suffocating them. Uh, a lot of people imagine, you know, um, a lion out on the plains of Africa when it attacks its prey. It doesn't, contrary to what some people think, tear it apart and chew it all up, then take the pieces home. What it does, it, it goes for the throat and holds the animal down until it suffocates and then drags it back home. They're not known for, um, you know, just tearing an animal to pieces. Um, and that seems to be the case with the Puerto Rican creatures, that they go for the, for the neck and suffocate the animal. But what's weird is that there actually aren't many reports of the animals, uh, excuse me, the chupacabra, actually um, attacking and eating the animals. For the most part, the animals are left just strewn around. Mm. But when reportedly um, studies of the bodies have been undertaken, uh, I've heard a lot of stories about um, significant amounts of blood missing from the bodies. Now, granted, that's sort of a controversial area because it's one that isn't fully proven one way or the other. Um, but nevertheless, you know, it does have some parallels with the cattle mutilation angle, but there are sort of distinct differences as well. Hmm. Um, what kind of investigations have been done on the animals that have been found? Has there been DNA done on the near the puncture wound to see if there could be any cross correlation uh, using the DNA database that might give us uh, a glimpse into the possibilities of the chupacabra? Well, yeah, that's a good question because it actually has, uh, but not with much success, and I'll hmm. explain why. The, actually, the first time I went to Puerto Rico in 2004 was with the Sci-Fi Channel to make a show called Proof Positive, and right. the, the show basically was like a cross between um, CSI, the, the TV show, and I guess the X-Files, in the sense that they wanted teams to go out and investigate things, but where something could be scientifically analyzed at the end of the investigation. Right. And it turned out that in the one of the Chupacabra cases we investigated, one of the people involved actually had recovered um, a feather from a chicken that had reportedly been attacked and killed by Chupacabra, and he hung on to this feather. This was back in 98, so he hung on to it for six years until we did the show in 2004. Now, the, the feather was actually handed over to the, the uh, Sci-Fi Channel, <coughs> who then contracted a, you know, a legitimate DNA analysis company mm -hmm. to study it. Now, unfortunately, it degraded to such an extent over six years that there was nothing worth, you know, actually finding or even that could be analysed. And of course, the other big problem is that, unfortunately, you know, Puerto Rico is a very, in, in portions at least, is a, you know, a poor place, and a lot of the farmers, they're just not concerned about you know, proving what the chupacabra sure. is. They're more concerned about, you know, keeping their livelihood going and their animals alive. So, in other words, you know, where somebody else might think, well, I'll keep this, you know, for the day it gets analysed, they've got more important things on their mind than worrying about what some TV show is going to think about the chupacabra, you know. Exactly. Um, so, in that sense, it's, it's a challenge and has been difficult to actually... Um, find evidence but what i have found is that every time i've been to puerto rico you know the people there are very friendly and helpful and i've heard some really good stories about um you know for example um studies undertaken on the bodies and uh, significant amounts of blood reportedly removed and um veterinarians taking a deep interest in the mystery albeit sometimes more often than not off the record rather than specifically on the record which is understandable as well i think what kind of evidence have you seen nick you know like when we talk about cryptozoology, uh, there are many people who have made plaster casts of what they believe to be the 
the big foot yeah. of big feet. Um, are there is there any trace evidence that that you have seen or that has been documented to give any hint of what the chupacabra is besides the the well, remains of animals? Well, yeah, the first thing I was going to say, I've actually seen the remains of some of them, and, you know, it, it does look weird. I mean, yeah. ironically, the very first investigation we did in 2004 was a, a rancher's home where he bred chickens in his backyard, just a very small backyard, and he, each chicken had its own cage. He woke up one morning to find the cages not torn apart, but something in the middle of the night had stealthily opened them, and they were all dead from a puncture wound to the neck. I actually saw some of these and um, on photographs that the, the the guy had taken, and and it was just really weird because there been there was no noise in the night. You know the chickens weren't screaming or anything mm-hmm. like that. It was almost as if they'd been rendered into silence. Um, so that was weird. You know that was eye opening to see the, the the nature of the attacks. Now in terms of other things, I have seen plaster casts and things like that, um, but again. To a degree, they're they're interesting because well, a lot of people don't realise there aren't any indigenous dangerous wild animals on Puerto Rico. You know, there's nothing like big cats or anything like mm-hmm. that at all, and um, wolves, anything. You know, the biggest animals, the imported animals like pigs, and cows, that kind of thing. Um, but I have seen a number of tracks and prints um, that are, that were plaster casted. The problem being, you know, they were slightly distorted because they were in muddy environments. You know, Puerto Rico is very hot, yeah. so, the, the, you know, the dirt melts quickly, but they have a lot of rain as well. So, you know, when you're trying to look at casts, they can massively distort depending on, you know, the expansion from the heat and then the, the rain and everything else. But I have seen tracks made in the areas where the ranchers have said these attacks occurred. And... Um, uh, what the most interesting thing for me when you talk about evidence is that when I went to Puerto Rico in the second occasion, uh, this was actually with another TV company from Canada called Red Star Films, we met with a guy um, who was a former civil defense worker mm-hmm. with the Puerto Rican government, and he brought along with him what I can only describe as almost like a literal X-file. It was about an inch and a half thick, and it was an official civil defense file on chupacabra attacks and it was filled with drawings and even paintings that some of the witnesses had made of the creature and he had this typical row of spikes down the head and neck and this sort of lizard type appearance and there were photographs taken by the civil defense guys out at the site and you know they they photographed the dead animals the ranch the area to get a full picture and got witness statements as well so that was sort of a really cool uh, piece of evidence you know it was it was official evidence right. relating to the attack red star films uh, that's uh paul kimball isn't it yeah that's correct yeah it was, it was paul um, yeah. who arranged it all um, yeah. they were making a show um called fields of fear yeah uh, for the space channel and um paul said you know we want to do a bit of shooting in canada uh, excuse me in puerto, puerto rico, rico. Yeah. And he said, do you want to be the guy who we sort of film on the road? And I said, well, yeah, sure, you know, that would be cool. So, uh, yeah, that's what we did. Yeah, I've had the pleasure of having Paul on the show uh, many times. In fact, Paul Kimball is Stanton Friedman's nephew. Yes, he is. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Small world, isn't it, my friend? Yes, it is. (laughs) Now, if, if the Chupacabra originated in Puerto Rico, how did it get to mainland USA? Well, that's a question I get asked a lot of the time. And the big answer is, or the small answer, depending on how you look at it, is mm-hmm. it actually didn't. And it sounds confusing, but it's actually easy to explain. Is What happened is that, as I said, the Chupacabra mystery kicked off big time in Puerto Rico in 95. Right. And the same thing happened in the U.S., uh, chiefly in Texas, in 2004. Now, ranchers were reporting this strange animal attacking their animals, not unlike the situation in Puerto Rico with puncture wounds to the neck. Mm-hmm. Um, there were stories about people seeing the these animals lapping the blood, not sucking the blood, but lapping the blood from the dead animals, but not eating the bodies. So that's very like the Puerto Rican chupacabra. And that word about that got around. And when one or two got killed, uh, one was shot initially, another one got hit by a, a truck, and the initial photographs on the internet showed something that looked like an oversized, giant, hairless rat. 
nobody could figure out what they were from the pictures. And the term chupacabra was applied to them. And because it was such, even back then, it was sort of an iconic term, it stuck. You know, it became forever then onwards the chupacabra. Now, the big difference between the Puerto Rican chupacabra and the, the Texas and now the wider U.S. one is not just the physical differences like the wings and the spikes in Puerto Rico and the more canine-looking ones in the U.S. The big difference um, is that we actually have corpses, several corpses over the years um, of the of the Texas versions. And as far as those ones are concerned, because we've had the bodies, we have been able to autopsy them and get DNA. And the DNA has shown them to be um, coyotes or coyotes mixed with uh, red wolf, Mexican oh, wolf, and sometimes with dogs. But it's not as simple as it initially sounds. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, the skeptics have said that the hairless nature of the animal shows that it's mange. Mange is a condition caused by a mite mm -hmm. that causes irritation, and the dogs or the wolves or the coyotes scratch their skin. You know, they bleed, infection sets in, they get sick, and they often die. And the hair typically falls out in tufts. But with these animals, the hair isn't falling out in tufts. It's like they're, they're developing in an almost completely uniform 100% condition. Even in the ones where it's not 100%, it's sort of like a very, almost like a, a stubble downy kind of covering, which is not typical of mange. Now, on top of that, they're also developing with their front limbs slightly shorter than their back limbs. And this gives them sort of a weird hopping movement. And there are some witnesses who've said they've actually seen them rise onto their hind legs and actually hop along in sort of a weird hopping motion. On top of that, they have um, a strange overbite, which should not exist, of about an inch and a half. And they have these odd-looking pouches on their hindquarters. And so what we have is a known animal, but which seems to be genetically mutating at a very quite a quick rate since around about 2003 2004 to the present day and we're not really sure as to why they are mutating um as i said the the, the uh mangy coyote is too is far too simplistic but these texas chupacabras there's something else far stranger going on and one of the theories is it could be from certain pollutants called mutagens which mm -hmm. actually affect an animal at a dna level to the extent where they can start taking on different appearances. You know, their body, their entire form at a DNA level begins to change. Nick, you and I have to take a brief break for the news at the bottom of the hour. Please stand by. Always great talking to you. And once again, congratulations on your new book, Chupacabra Thank Road you. Trip. Exo Nation, for more information on Nick, www.nickredfern14.blogspot. Dot com And Nick and I will be back on the other side of this short break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada on the Exxon Broadcast Network and Starcom Radio Network. Don't go away. Oh, yeah. Ever wondered if your advertising dollar is really working for you? If your ad would have been here, you and more than 4 million people would be listening to it right now. Contact ads at exxoneradiotv.com. One Florida drug dealer made a serious mistake when he dared peddle his poisons on the schoolyard of Robert W. Morgan's preteen daughter. Morgan, a budding film director, tracked him to his hidden Everglades lair where his meth lab mysteriously blew sky high. When Morgan's demands to police to make grammar school playgrounds safer from drugs were ignored, he sought the counsel of CIA operative Frank Sturgis. Again, he was warned to give up what was becoming an obsession. Instead, Robert used his reputation as a filmmaker to infiltrate the mob by stroking their egos and offering to make films for them offshore so they could import them as foreign product without paying taxes. When they agreed to build him a studio in Panama, Robert called the DEA and FBI and offered to work undercover. In time, their combined efforts revealed how the mob was secretly laundering billions of dollars through the Vatican Bank in Rome before returning to the States as foreign investments. Now read Morgan's story, Citizen Spy, Vatican Cover-Up, The Mob, Money Laundering and Murder, available at Amazon dot com bn dot com and borders dot com 
The new non-fiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Expose Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades, there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Mnemology science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Mnemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. Welcome back, everyone. Nick Redfern is our special guest. Always a great pleasure having you on the show. Nick, congratulations on your new book entitled Chupacabra Road Trip. And explanation for more information on Nick, visit his website, nickredfern14.blogspot.com. Uh, Nick, uh, during your investigation into discovering who, what, when, where, why is the Chupacabra, what was your most exciting experience? actually say it was one of the occasions when I went to Puerto Rico and um, I interviewed a woman named Norca and um, this sort of gets it's an important one because it was a very credible case mm-hmm. but also because it pushed again the, the years back as to when this phenomenon began. Now Norca lived in this huge house high up in the El Yonke rainforest which is this gigantic rainforest that dominates Puerto Rico and she had like this huge beautiful house you know like a classic house built on stilts, you know, on the side of a hill, but um, we in a totally sort of jungle rainforest environment, and um, she had sort of a cool background. She was one of the first 
women on Puerto Rico to have a motorbike, and she entered also and won all sorts of um, motorcycle competitions wow. in Puerto Rico. And, yeah, and she was in her seventies when I met her about um, well back in the mid two thousands. And uh, but she had this encounter when she was driving home when she lived at this same house. Um, and to give you an idea, to sort of get to the house, you follow this long and winding road that sort of makes its way around the El Yonke rainforest. And she was driving home, and because the roads are so winding, you know, it's hard to get your speed up above sort of 15, 20 miles an hour before you reach another sort of precarious bend. And as she was driving home, sort of 7 o'clock at night, you know, it was starting to go dark, she got her lights on, suddenly she saw this figure shuffle out from one side of the road as if it was trying to get to the other and she described it as about somewhere between sort of four to five feet tall a dark in color and it seemed to be sort of cloaked as she got closer she could see that the cloak wasn't actually a cloak after all it was a pair of large wings that were sort of semi wrapped around its shoulders and it was mm. making this kind of odd shuffling hunched movement across the road and so she she could do nothing but basically put the brakes on and just sit there in what she said was just complete terror and this thing looked at her and she could see that it had somewhat of like a a bat like face you know a bat sort of looks a little bit like a a cross between a rodent and a monkey if you look at its face um she said it looked like that but it was if it was a bat then it was you know the biggest bat that anyone's ever seen um, but she said it clearly had wings. It clearly had a bat-like face, but it was, as I said, four to five feet tall. And she could only sit there as it literally shuffled across and vanished into the thick um, forest on the other side of the road. And um, as I said, you know, the she came across very, very credible. She agreed to be filmed while she was interviewed. And we went over various parts of the story over and over again. And she talked about how she was that close. She could actually see its fingers, which she said were sort of attached to the wings uh, to a degree, and uh, almost as like flaps under mm. the arm, that kind of thing. And she said she was that close, she could see the fingers, which were more like a cross between fingers and claws. She described them sort of like talon-like almost. And, um, and you know, she was a really good witness, and that was probably one of the most, certainly one of the most memorable and amazing cases. Well, is there any is there any correlation, in your opinion, uh, Nick, between the chupacabra and the Mothman? Well, you know, that's a, an interesting scenario because we can find reports all across the world of strange mm-hmm. winged creatures. You know, certainly Mothman's the most famous. Yeah. The the, um, the Puerto Rican chupacabra is another. Um, and I mean, you mentioned at the, sh- the beginning of the show about me living in, in, in Dallas. Yes. Well, just a few hours' drive away, the city of Houston, if you head south, a lot of people don't know that there was a very weird story from the early 1950s, 53, when the Houston newspapers reported on several witnesses who'd seen a creature that became known as the Houston Batman. And as the name suggests, it was like a winged humanoid. And, and it actually made the major um, Houston newspaper at the time and was sort of the talk of the area for a few days. And you can even sort of apply stories like the Jersey Devil to it and and things like this. There are a lot of accounts from just about here, there, and everywhere. And also they sound not sort of dissimilar to ancient reports of gargoyles and things like that. And um, so there's there's definitely, you know, a flying humanoid phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And the the Puerto Rican Chupacabra and Mothman can both be said to fall into that category. You know, what do you think of the theory that the Chupacabra is paranormal rather than flesh and blood animal? Well, I mean, this is something I've heard on literally every occasion I've been to Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. I've heard various theories tend to crop up time and time again. Now, Puerto Rico, you know, is a heavily sort of uh, superstitious land. Very much so. They have a lot of folklore, mythology, legends. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a, a, you know, there's the the religion of Santeria there, which involves, um, you know, sacrificial um, rites with animals, that kind of thing. And I've heard stories about how, not a Santeria group, but how a sort of, if you like, a cult-based group Mm -hmm. um, reportedly conjured one of these creatures up or more of them and from some sort of supernatural realm. Now, of course, 
it's incredibly difficult to understand or sort of really, I guess, explain what they might mean by, you know, a supernatural realm. But we're talking about sort of the opening of doorways to or portals to other realms that coexist with ours where supernatural entities could come through if you use the right form of rituals and invocations and uh, now whether that story is true or not or has any validity to it i don't know but what i do know is that there hasn't been an occasion when i've been to puerto rico that i haven't heard at least a few people focus on that angle when i say people a few people i mean the ranchers the farmers uh, even the veterinarians occasionally um and, and eyewitnesses and villagers have all said well you know this thing somebody let it loose by dabbling in the world of the occult, that kind of thing. With all the modern technology that we have at our disposal today, Nick, how come it cannot be used to to capture the evidence that is required to identify what the chupacabra really is? You know, we have uh, we have all these all these webcams, we have the ability of putting isolated cameras in areas that'll you know, that are triggered by movement, take pictures and so on, just like they're trying to do with Bigfoot. And yet, these creatures seem to evade human detection. Well, you know, that's one of the reasons why the paranormal theory has developed around Bigfoot as well, rather than it just being an unknown ape. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, one of the things I would say about Puerto Rico, you know, coming back to the a lot of the farmers who, you know, unfortunately a lot of the people on the island don't have, you know, that much money... So, in other words, they're not going out of their way to, you know, buy trail cams and things like this yeah. in the event that, you know, something might crop up. But what I would say, what I, I quickly came to sort of appreciate why these creatures could hide out so well on Puerto Rico. And I'll explain what I mean by that. A lot of the um, sightings of the Chupacabra, like the one I mentioned of the Lady Norker in 1975, right. a lot of the actual... Um, sightings of the creature occur high in the El Yonke rainforest, this gigantic rainforest. But most of the attacks occur late at night in the early hours down in the lowlands and on the farms, which, you know, which aren't obviously in the rainforest. They're mm-hmm. just way below in the towns and villages. So this has given rise to one of the reasons why these things are so incredibly difficult to find, because they're very astute and clever at hiding out in the rainforest and the only time they come down into civilization is in the early hours to hunt, and then they head back up to the rainforest. Now, on top of that, a lot of people don't know that Puerto Rico is just peppered across the entire island with cave systems. Now, even by the admission of the Puerto Rican government, uh, Puerto Rican authorities, they admit that a lot of those cave systems have literally never been explored. And, and I do mean never. They're out mm. of bounds because, you know, of safety concerns. And I've heard a lot of stories about people claiming to see these chupacabra occasionally coming out of these cave systems. Now, if that's true, it actually would make a lot of sense, the idea, you know, that people are looking for them in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the rainforest or in the fields, not realising they could be hundreds of feet underground in these vast tunnels, caves and caverns, which they might be extremely adept at, you know, manoeuvring through. And if, you know, if there is sort of a, an angle to this where they are some sort of large bat-like animal, well, you know, bats have really good, it's not exactly night vision, but I mean, in simpli- in sim- for simplistic terms, you know, it is. Um, you know, even if it's pitch black in those environments, there's a possibility they could, you know, um, actually skillfully get around them as well. Well, of course, because when you look at all the different uh, caves where there are massive colonies of, of bats, you know, that that would make perfect sense. Yeah, well, that's, that's one of the theories yeah. as well. It's something like a giant prehistoric bat that survived extinction, you know, which would hmm. be pretty fearsome if you were faced with a five-foot-tall bat, you know, with about a nine-foot wingspan or something. Yeah, that, that would certainly... Um certainly cause a lot of people to shake their heads and scratch their heads and say what else is there out there that we have that have gone undetected up until this time and and once again nick it seems that with all this modern technology at our at our disposal more and more secrets are eluding us well yeah and again that's you know that's one of the 
baffling things that these things like Bigfoot, mm -hmm. you know, to move just away from the Chupacabra. I mean, Bigfoot, we get numerous reports from the United States, and these things are, you know, 800, excuse me, 8 feet tall, 500 pound hulking animals, and yet we cannot catch one, kill one, they don't get hit by cars. Yeah. And again, you know, there are some there are admittedly some weird aspects of some Bigfoot stories where people said they swore the creature just sort of winked out in a flash of light or vanished, um, you know, vanished from view. There are people who've seen Bigfoot at the same time and same location as strange lights in the sky. Um, so there are certain aspects that suggest that Bigfoot, even if it is a flesh and blood animal, it may not just be like a North American equivalent of an African gorilla. There could be something sure. weirder going on that we're not really understanding or seeing. What are some of the conspiracy theories around the Chupacabra? Well, the, the primary one, and again, I've heard this every time I've been there, like the occult one, mm -hmm. is that the Chupacabras are actually the result of sort of dark and disturbing genetic manipulation, the idea of taking something like a, like a chimpanzee and genetically altering it. And the theory I've heard, again, every single time to explain why this is being done is the idea of military agencies being contracted or defense contractors creating sort of underground Frankenstein labs where they're trying to develop the ultimate killing machine that could be unleashed on the battlefield. You know, it, it sounds like sci-fi to imagine, you know, you would suddenly unleash 200 um, chupacabra-type creatures onto the battlefield to attack the enemy. Mm -hmm. But that's the story I've heard again so many times. And, uh, you know, the idea of fringe experimentation on monkeys and some of the, the larger apes like, you know, chimpanzees. And I even heard a story about gorillas used. Now, of course, whether or not this is true is the big question but you know there's there are a lot of stories like that um so i mean who knows where you know the truth mm -hmm. begins and the and the rumors begin but as far as the, the conspiracies are concerned there's that one now the other one and this is an interesting one as well is that in many of the places where the chupacabra has been seen particularly in the 1990s there were a lot of um ufo sightings i mean every again every time i've been to puerto rico i've got substantial numbers of ufo reports quite a few reports interestingly enough of ufos coming out the waters of the coasts of um the, you know the coastal waters off puerto rico and this has given rise to rumors of things like under sea or you know underwater um installations if you like that kind of thing extraterrestrial bases um that's something I've heard many times. So the UFO angle and the, the genetic experiment are the sort of the two major conspiracy theories surrounding the Chupacabra. When it comes to the, the cross breeding of, of, uh, of something with, with the chimpanzee, are, are chimpanzees uh, native to, to Puerto Rico? No, they're not. Um, now, what's interesting is that there's actually a little island just off the coast of Puerto Rico. It's mm -hmm. part of Puerto Rico, which is off the coast. And um, although, you know, I want to stress these people aren't involved in anything nefarious. Sure. But for years, it's called the um, Car Caribbean uh, Primate Research Center. And they do a lot of research into what's called SIV, which is the, um, the monkey uh, equivalent of HIV in people. So they, they've done a lot of experiments on monkeys on the island to try and understand and cope better, you know, for, with patients who have HIV. Mm -hmm. uh, now, as I want to stress, you know, they have nothing to do with all this stuff that's going on the main island of Puerto Rico. But it is interesting, you know, that there is a precedent for, <coughs> excuse me, experiments going on on Puerto Rico, or excuse me, on its islands, with monkeys. Um, now, you know, there should not... In the wild, there aren't any sort of native, um, you know, monkeys running around right. Puerto Rico. And yet people said they've seen them. So, um, you know, it's not impossible that there could be some uh, particular like rhesus monkeys or rhesus macaques, to give them their their real name. Uh, there have been people who said they've seen rhesus monkeys running around the island, which, you know, which should not be on Puerto Rico. So it doesn't prove anything. It's not, right. you know, it's not the, the ideal smoking gun but it is kind of suggestive of something at least that ties in 
to a degree with some of these stories about you know animals that shouldn't sure. live on, on Puerto Rico actually being there. And, and how do we know that at one time there wasn't a shipwreck and on that ship there were monkeys and the monkeys landed, well, yeah. you know? That could happen. I mean, yeah. I've heard a few reports of people seeing big cats, you know, like uh, black leopards and things like that on Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. You know, there should not be anything native like that. But you know, sometimes weird things happen. Um, I mean, England, where I'm originally from, back in the, and not too far from where I grew up, but about 90 years ago, um, a colony of wallabies escaped from a local zoo, you know, and trying to, con trying to corral in, you know, 30 wallabies <laughs> is impossible. <laughs> so they just left them to their own devices. And the descendants and the descendants and the descendants of those originals are still there. You know, people will be driving through these little villages sometimes. Now, one will bound across the road. They sort of <laughs> still live in the, the woods and the fields, and people just leave them alone. But, you know, if you drive sort of 20 miles from where I grew up and you sort of stay a few days, you actually stand a chance of seeing one of them if you're lucky. That's so, you know, things do happen. Strange things occur where nature sometimes helps things to pop up and survive sure. in places where they just shouldn't shouldn't be, you know. What is being done these days to to establish what the chupacabra is? Are there different organizations that are actively going out to to find uh, chupacabra like there are with Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster and other uh, anomalies? Yeah, there are. I mean, you know, we're sort of limited in terms of the Puerto Rican mm -hmm. creature because of the lack of a body. But a good friend of mine, Ken Gerhard, who lives down in San Antonio, and I interviewed Ken extensively for the book because he's got a lot of interesting theories on the, you know, the mutated animal theory and things right. like this. But Ken um, has extensively, in fact, he's probably the one person more than any other who has really dug deep into the Texas Chupacabra and he's you know, he's examined corpses and um, at one point even had the frozen remains of one of the creatures at home. Um, and so, in other words, Ken has taken a very proactive approach, which is a good approach, of getting out into the field and, you know, it can be a bit grisly and grim, but mm -hmm. examining the bodies and comparing them with regular coyotes, comparing the skin, comparing the hair. And, and Ken, again, you know, is somebody who's very skilled at looking at these creatures you know he's sure that we're not looking at regular mange we're seeing something very different and of course he's noted these again as, as other researchers these weird pouches on the hindquarters the short limbs right. the overbite so you know we've got people like ken who which is so important people actually go out into the field and don't just do internet-based work you know it's actually going out to the ranches and saying to the farmer hey can i look at that you know, chupacabra that you've got um, stuffed or frozen or whatever. And that's what it takes. It takes actual field research. Yeah, I mean, the Internet's a great tool for resources, yeah. but there's nothing really to, you know, replace actually going out there on an expedition and trying to find things. Because very often, particularly like on Puerto Rico, again, you know, the average farmer isn't, blogging about yeah. what happened on his farm the night before. It's just, you're going to find those stories out by treating the people with respect and yeah. gaining their confidence, and then they open up to you. Maybe the farmers have been coexisting with the chupacabra for many years, and to them it's not an anomaly, it's just a fact of life. Well, it could be, and yeah. it may be. If it, is a fact, if it is a fact of life, to some of them at least, they may just have thought, well, what's the point of reporting it yeah. when it's not going to make any difference? And um, so they stay silent. I think that does happen, particularly in small, particularly in little villages and towns, like you have a lot of them in Puerto Rico. You know, you, you leave one town, and then you're suddenly out in the wilds for 10 miles. So that little village or town can be quite isolated and, and hidden. And when when you get circumstances like that anywhere in the world, you know, little um, communities become enclosed. And it's kind of like Vegas. What happens there stays there. <laughs> yeah. Nick, what are you working on now uh, since your new book, uh, The Chupacabra Road Trip, comes out in September? By the way, Exxon Nation, it's available uh, by Llewellyn Press, a great bunch of people. Um, what's next for Nick Redfern? Well, coincidentally, I've got another book out very soon as well with another company. Actually, my agent's um, company is called Lisa Hagen Books. And it'll be my third book on the Men in Black. It uh, updates people on all the new stories and wow. theories and, 
cases that I've got since my previous MIB book came out in 2010, and, and it's called Men in Black, so it's easy to remember. And that'll be out um, within the month as well. Well, we'll have to get you back on to talk about that book, Nick. But as always, time goes by so fast when you're with us. Let our listeners know how they can find out more about you. Okay. Well, people can reach me at my blog, which, as you said, is Nick Redfern Fortean, F O R T E A N dot blogspot dot com, or just type Nick Redfern in at Facebook, and there's a few Nick Redferns, but you'll find me. Um, always happy to chat with people, and people can also get the books um, from Barnes and Noble as well. Nick, take care of yourself, my friend. I look forward to the next time when you and I meet here in the X Zone. All right, sounds good, Rob. Thanks a lot. Take care, pal. Be safe. You too. Bye bye. You Bye-bye too. now. ExoNation, Nick Redfern has been my guest this hour. His new book, uh, Chupacabra Road Trip, Barnes & Noble. It's published by Llewellyn. His uh, blog spot again is www.nickredfernfortian.blogspot.com. A great guy. Always a great pleasure having Nick on the show. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news at six and a half minutes past the top of the hour as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away.